like a musical performance for like everyone. It's like a musical performance for like everyone. Hello, I'm Colleen Corey. I'm the Dean of the University of Maine School of Law, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the annual Frank M. Cotton Lecture on Law and Public Service, which has been um, one of, always been one of the highlights of the academic year at Maine Law. It is also a great honor for me to have the opportunity to present to you and to welcome back to Maine our distinguished lecturer, the Honorable Richard J. Goldstone. And to introduce as well Judge Frank M. Coffin, the distinguished jurist and public servant for whom this lecture is named. We are also delighted this evening to welcome Justice Goldstone's wife, Nolene, the family members of Judge Coffin, Mrs. Ruth Coffin, Judge Coffin's wife, and their children, Nancy, Susan, and Douglas, and grandchildren, Adam and Harpswell, along with many of Judge Coffin's law clerks, who as a group have been so instrumental in making this lecture series a reality. Over the years, Judge Coffin's clerks have helped in innumerable ways to make this lecture a success. But during the past year, the Coffin Clever, as they are known, helped Maine Law reach another milestone in the glorious history of this lecture. I am thrilled to announce to all of you who have been so loyal to the Coffin Lecture, that through the dedication and generosity of Judge Coffin's clerks, the Coffin Lecture now boasts an endowment that when all the pledge payments are made, will total over $150,000. Through these generous gifts, the clerks have helped to ensure that the Coffin Lecture will continue to enlighten and challenge all of us throughout the 21st century, if we're lucky. <laughs> I'm planning to stay around for the whole 21st century myself. The University of Maine School of Law takes great pride in its sponsorship of the annual Coffin Lecture. The lecture reflects and celebrates the law school's strong and abiding commitment to public service and challenges us to consider new ways to ensure that law and the legal profession continue to serve the public good. Since its inception in 1992, the Coffin Lecture has brought to our community a brilliant array of extraordinarily talented and thoughtful individuals. Each of our previous 12 Coffin Lecturers who are listed in your, on the back of your program have challenged us to um, reflect in, uh, in powerful ways about the intersection of law and public service. And there is no doubt in any of our minds, as I can tell from the attendance tonight, uh, that Justice Goldstone will continue in this fine uh, tradition. The committee of uh, the selection committee for the Coffin Lecture, which consists of faculty, students, and former clerks of Judge Coffin, Look for distinguished individuals who are exemplars of a life devoted to law and dedicated public service. Um, Justice Goldstone was an obvious choice, um, as you can imagine. A champion of international justice and human rights, Justice Goldstone was a member of the Constitutional Court of South Africa until his retirement last year. In that role, he was responsible for interpreting the new South African Constitution and guiding the nation's transition into democracy. A longtime opponent of apartheid, Justice Goldstone served as chair of the Commission of Inquiry regarding the prevention of public violence and intimidation in South Africa, which came to be known as the Goldstone Commission. As Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has said, Justice Goldstone has been at the forefront of one of the biggest challenges facing emerging democracies today which is how to address the grave and systematic human rights abuses committed by the leaders of a previous regime. The justice has been called upon time and again to lead international justice investigations. From 1999 to 2001, for example, he chaired the International Independent Inquiry on Kosovo, which investigated human rights abuses against ethnic Albanians in that province. Five years earlier, from 1994 to 1996, 
Uh, Justice Goldstone served as the chief prosecutor of the UN International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. In 1997, he was asked by the government of Argentina to serve as an international, on an international panel to mon monitor uh, Argentina's inquiry into uh, the activities of Nazis in the Republic since 1938. Justice Goldstone has also served as chairperson of a group of international experts that drafted the Declaration of Human Duties and Responsibilities for the Director General of UNESCO, and as co-chair of the International Task Force on Terrorism established in 2001 by the International Bar Association. And just earlier this year, uh, he was appointed by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, to, as a member of an independent panel conducting an inquiry into allegations of impropriety in the Iraq oil for food program. Justice Goldstone, I will commend this book to you, has chronicled his experiences in several of these investigations in his memoir, For Humanity, Reflections of a War Crimes Investigator. I forget the publisher, Justice Goldstone, maybe you can tell. Um, Justice Goldstone earned his law degree from the University of Witwatersrand uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. He practiced for almost 20 years as an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar. In 1980, he became a judge at the Transvaal Supreme Court, and nine years later was appointed a judge on the appellate division of that court, where he served until his appointment to the South African Constitutional Court in 1994. Not surprisingly, Justice Goldstone has received many honors and awards through the years, including the 1994 International Human Rights Award of the American Bar Association. Um, he has uh, received honorary degrees from a long list of uh, prestigious universities, including our own Bowdoin College up the road. Um, he uh, is a foreign member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences and has served as a visiting professor at New York University Law School and is currently a visiting professor at Fordham Law School. This provides just a summary, I actually have left a lot of things out, uh, of Justice Goldstone's many accomplishments. The real introduction, the one that really tells us about Justice Goldstone, will be given, as it always is, by another exemplar of a life devoted to law and public service, the individual for whom this lecture is named, uh, the Honorable Frank M. Coffin. For many of us in this room, Judge Coffin needs no introduction, but for the sake of our law students and others who are new to this lecture, I'm going to provide a very brief one. Judge Coffin is one of the small, select group of public servants who have served with distinction in all three branches of our government. In Judge Coffin's case as a United States Congressman, also in the executive branch as Deputy Administrator of the Agency for International Development, and of course in the judiciary. First appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit in 1965, he served as its Chief Judge from 1972 to 1983. He assumed senior status on the court in 1989, but I can assure you that he has not retired. In addition to hearing cases by assignment, he has uh, worked hard, I think you're halfway through your memoirs now, Judge Cotton, uh, and continues to give generously of his time and his prestige to ensure access to justice for all citizens. Um, as a graduate, a graduate of Bates College and the Harvard Law School, Judge Coffin is the author of four books and numerous articles. He also holds honorary degrees from Bates, Colby, Bowdoin, and the University of Maine. Uh, and in 2001, he was the recipient of the most prestigious award that a federal judge can receive, the Edward J. Devitt Award for Distinguished Service to Justice. Although a graduate of Harvard Law, Judge Coffin has been a wonderful friend of the University of Maine School of Law, supporting us and guiding us and our students in many ways for many years. As I say every year, because it's true, one of the greatest pleasures of this job, being dean, is the opportunity to work with Judge Coffin and to see him in action. It is a measure of the awe and the affection with which we in the legal community hold him that we have this wonderful crowd here tonight. It is my honor and privilege to present a man who has always spoken 
to our better natures and who has kept our best hopes for justice alive. Although perhaps not with respect to the Red Sox. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't need that last fuss. <laughs> I was wondering, as Colleen kept speaking, and apparently uh, all of you out here have had, uh, don't have anything better to do tonight, so we try to fill this time profitably for you, uh, despite my inadequacies with regard to a certain brand of athletics. Now. Our lecture, lecture of this year is living proof of the fact that our theme of law and public service can extend <clears throat> to the international scene. I cannot think of a better exemplar of that groundbreaking range of service than Justice Goldstone. You already know from what you have read and also heard from Dean Corey, the variety of key judicial, prosecutorial, and leadership positions he has held. What I want to do in these few minutes is to add some insight into the kind of person we have with us tonight and his legacy. It started at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. As he writes, in his splendid book, For Humanity, as a student, he quickly sensed the gulf between the white suburbs and the squalor of black townships, where students wishing to study at night had to settle for paraffin lamps or candles. He became an activist, and before long, found himself elected to the Executive Committee of the National Union of South African Students. Studies and fighting apartheid did not completely preempt his time. A foreshadowing of his flair for being in the right place at the right time was revealed by a pack of unruly rats which in a nearby psychology lab at the university refused to cooperate with another student performing an experiment. They insisted on running the wrong way. Frustrated beyond words, this researcher rushed outdoors and there on the steps of the university met for the first time our speaker. And thus it was that the wayward rodents of Whitwater's land <laughs> launched an enduring romance between Nolene Bailey and her future husband. <clears throat> Justice Goldstone did not begin at the top in his extrajudicial public service. As a young justice on the Transvaal Supreme Court, he availed himself of a seldom invoked privilege, that of visiting the prisons where all too many of his country's people were detained without trial. For over two years, at the request of the president judge of his court, he visited some 3,000 prisoners facilitated visitors by, visits by families, and devised ways of supplying them with magazines, which he stockpiled in his garage at times, and clothing. In addition to this basic instinct of humaneness, other trademarks of the Goldstone style were revealed after he had been chosen by both President de Klerk and the, and the African National Congress to head what has become known as the Goldstone Commission of Inquiry regarding the prevention of public violence 
and intimidation. In his own quiet, persistent, unorthodox style, he accomplished wonders in changing the way things were done. He persuaded President de Klerk to release promptly to the public all reports of his commission instead of sitting on them until a more convenient time and perhaps a spin could be put on them. He saw to it that the commission fielded its own investigation teams with South African police monitored by foreign senior police and independent attorneys. He procured the participation of an eminent Indian jurist, Justice Bhagwati of Bombay, to investigate the Boy Patong massacre of innocent people. His themes were refusal to bow to government pressure, inclusiveness, openness, or transparency of operations, and even handed fairness. The result was that trust in the commission steadily widened and deepened on the part of all warring factions. Another quality was an ability to induce extraordinary action through personal contact and friendship. This is why Justice Bagwati dropped everything after a phone call from, from Goldstone and flew immediately to South Africa. This is why Justice Goldstone was able to arrange financial assistance to protect witnesses testifying before the Goldstone Commission. He had asked England's Foreign Minister Douglas Hurd to talk with the European Union and see if it could provide the modest sum of $20,000. Douglas Hurd did that, but after considerable bureaucratic double talk, one diplomat present, the Danish Foreign Minister Elman Jensen, with a naughty gleam in his eye, writes Justice Goldstone, stated that he wouldn't want to trouble the bureaucrats and that Denmark would make the contribution. <laughs> this personal quality was why American law schools provided valuable research pro bono. And this was why when the justice ran into difficulty getting money to travel to Kigali in Rwanda to iron out an obstacle to the newly established International Tribunal, Foreign Minister Coffey of Switzerland quickly contributed 100,000 Swiss francs. Finally, to all these qualities, Justice Goldstone has demonstrated what we may expect in an international prosecutor, absolute independence. He writes, by their nature, war crimes investigations are politically controversial, so that the independence of a war crimes prosecutor is even more important than that of prosecutors operating within national jurisdictions. He adds that they should be held fully accountable for their actions. He favors review and confirmation of indictments by highly credentialed judges who would not take part in later proceedings in any case so reviewed. He ends his book, For Humanity, on a note of optimism that soon this young century will see a more effective honoring of victims' rights and a more responsible world community. There is no one better qualified to enlighten us, citizens of a country which very badly needs enlightenment, on a commitment to international order, a commitment whose time has come. I have the signal honor of presenting the Honorable Richard Goldstein.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a wonderful privilege and great pleasure to be with you this evening and to be back for the second time this year uh, in May. One of the unexpected pleasures of having been invited to deliver this coffin lecture was telling people in New York or Washington DC or Boston that I was delivering the Frank Coffin Lecture. And the, the reaction of people to that has been really quite remarkable. A warm glow suddenly <laughs> surrounds everybody in the room. Oh, and they say, oh, Judge Coffin, and follow wonderful remarks about, about Frank Coffin. And, and I'm looking forward in the next years of telling people that I had to deliver the <laughs> Coffin Lecture and to, and, and to enjoy the same warmth uh, and, 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 and reaction uh, that people have. Uh, it, it's, we've been with, with Judge and Mrs. Coffin since, since lunch today. I, I think I speak for Nodine uh, uh, as well. I, we, we feel we've known them for much longer than less than half a day. Um, and one of the great benefits of, of, of this invitation is spending uh, most of this weekend uh, with, with them. It's also been a delight to meet, to meet their family, two of their daughters, their some of their grandchildren and, and other members, once uh, their, their son uh, and, and other members of the Coffin family. So thank, thank you very much indeed for whoever is responsible for inviting me to deliver uh, this, this uh, annual Coffin lecture. The future of international criminal justice. Let me say, Judge, Judge Coffin, in his very uh, uh, generous and well researched introduction, uh, mentioned that I ended my book on a note of optimism. Let me immediately say that I remain optimistic about the future of international, uh, of international justice. A certain amount of caution in the optimism, but nevertheless optimism. O optimism because one must bear in mind that 60 years ago there was no such thing as international criminal justice. Nobody would have understood really what the concept was all about. We must remember that prior to the end of World War II, there was no international criminal law at all. Criminal law was only domestic criminal law. The only criminal law that could be dispensed was that dispensed by domestic courts. And for that reason, international criminals went, went free. There was, there was really almost a complete impunity for international criminals and especially war criminals. Because if you think about it, war criminals in their own countries and particularly and war criminals almost by definition come from oppressive societies, from dictatorships. War criminals don't as a, as a rule come from democracies. And in those oppressive societies where they come from, they, they more often than not regarded as war heroes and not war criminals. The change began in consequence of the Holocaust and the terrible war crimes that were committed by the Nazi leaders in World War II. Now the law is always reactive. It's not proactive and it cannot be. The law always reacts to facts on the ground, not only in the criminal field but, but throughout uh, the, the whole a, a plethora of, of, of legal mechanisms, laws, legal tools. When technology changes, the law has to change to keep up with it, whether it's, in, whether it's the internet or and after the First World War, the Geneva Conventions have to be changed to, to include uh, air warfare, which wasn't known before the First World War, and so on. And it's no different with regard to, to, to war crimes. But it was in consequence of the Second World War that governments, that nations, began to realize that they had to take notice and get involved when other governments ill-treated and, and violated fundamental human rights of their citizens. And that was a huge change and it's reflected in the Charter of the United Nations, which for the first time ever in an international legal instrument recognizes individual human rights. 
Because before the United Nations Charter, individuals, individual human beings, had no standing at all in international law. International law dealt with governments, and there were no courts, there were no mechanisms at all for individuals to seek justice uh, outside their own domestic courts. And by definition, again, in oppressive societies, they had no standing even in front of their own domestic courts. And they followed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was an aspirational document. It wasn't, uh, it didn't, it wasn't intended to have any legally binding effect. But it gave birth uh, to the, to the, in the 1960s uh, to, the, uh, to a whole series of international covenants dealing with human rights, and particularly the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant dealing with economic, social, and cultural rights. The other effect of World War II was to start questioning the absolute uh, theory of the sovereignty of nations. And that follows from what I've already mentioned, that the governments considered that they were entitled to take notice and to comment in the beginning. And that was a step forward on, these, on the human rights violations committed by other governments. A good illustration is in fact South Africa, my own country. South Africa had practiced racial discrimination and racial oppression for over, well over 300 years, since 1652, when the Dutch first uh, colonized uh, the Cape of Good Hope. And in 1948, the National Party introduced the apartheid system which really legalized what had been going on for 300 years before. And it was the, raised in the United Nations in 1948 by the Indian representative to the United Nations. He proposed a resolution condemning the manner in which the South African government was ill-treating people of Indian origin in South Africa. The, the resolution was passed uh, by the United Nations over the negative votes, obviously, of South Africa, but also of the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia, uh, who didn't want the United Nations looking into their uh, uh, racial policies uh, 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 at that time. The South African defense, which was, which was well accepted, certainly, in the Western, in the Western uh, democracy, was that this is not your business. The way we treat our citizens or ill-treat our citizens is our internal affair. And that, that, was, the, that, that was the generally accepted uh, spirit of the time. And that, that changed. That changed over, over the following decades, and it was the international community uh, that, that, that was instrumental <coughs> in bringing an end to apartheid. It was the pariah status visited on South Africa the sports boycotts, the economic sanctions, the divestment, the disinvestment, and particularly uh, that led by the United States uh, that forced South African white minority leaders to realize that the apartheid system of racial oppression was not only a dead end, but a bloody dead end at that. And it was in the United Nations in 1973 that the international uh, community uh, in the United, through the United Nations, uh, uh, passed the, the uh, international uh, 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 treaty which declared apartheid in South Africa to be a crime against humanity. Almost completing a circle that began at Nuremberg, which first recognized crimes against humanity as part of international law, and in 1973 declaring it indeed to be a crime against humanity. The Second World War also, and, and particularly Nuremberg, also opened a Pandora's box uh, with regard to universal jurisdiction. Until the Second World War, national courts only had jurisdiction, generally speaking, for crimes committed within their area of jurisdiction. United States courts could only hear criminal cases uh, in respect of crimes committed in the United States. And, and, and that that was the position literally in every country of the world. The one exception, of course, was for piracy. 
pilots would be brought to trial in any court in any land. Because if they couldn't, they'd get away with it. There would have been impunity because pilots didn't, by definition, didn't commit their, their crimes on land. They committed them on the high sea. And if there wasn't universal jurisdiction, there wouldn't be any court with jurisdiction. But the Second World War so horrified decent people in many, many countries that they decided that for some international crimes, there should be universal jurisdiction. That jurisdiction should not depend on where the crime was committed, but it should depend on the nature of the crime itself. And if it was sufficiently serious a crime, people guilty or, or people suspected of having committed those crimes should be brought to justice in the courts of any country, no matter how far removed or how remote or however disconnected with the actual commission of the crime. And that universal jurisdiction was first recognized internationally in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, uh, which, which, which defined the worst of war crimes and called them grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. And today, there's not a, a, a country that hasn't ratified those Geneva <coughs> Conventions, and they oblige all countries that have ratified to bring to justice people who commit grave breaches, serious war crimes, no matter where or when committed. And they go on to provide that if a country is unwilling or unable to do so, it is obliged to hand that person to a government of a country that is prepared to bring that person to justice. Universal jurisdiction for the brave people. The Apartheid Convention followed in 1973, as I mentioned. That too created universal jurisdiction for the crime of apartheid. It wasn't, it was honored in the breach. Regrettably, in hindsight, the Western democracies ignored the Apartheid Convention. South African government officials, ambassadors, other South Africans guilty of the crime of apartheid could come and do their business in New York or Washington or Ottawa or London or Paris or Bonn and not fear being arrested for having been complicit in the crime of apartheid. Apartheid may well have ended 10 years earlier had that convention been taken seriously in the countries, uh, in the trading, in the trading part of the countries of South Africa. The 1984 Torture Convention included provision for internet for universal jurisdiction, and that did have an effect. It was under that convention that General Pinochet was, uh, to the surprise of international lawyers of the international community that the former dictator of Chile was arrested in a London clinic in, in 1998 for crimes allegedly committed almost 20 years before. And he was arrested at the request of a Spanish judge for crimes committed against people who were now in Spain almost 20 years before. Universal jurisdiction, the Spanish courts were many thousands of miles from Chile, but they, they accepted universal jurisdiction and the House of Lords uh, in London agreed that this was a, 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 a recognized basis for exercising universal jurisdiction and, 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 and ordered the extradition of General Pinochet, later, later reversed by, by the British government on the grounds of the ill health of General Pinochet. But that, that arrest in the London clinic and its legality being recognized by the highest court uh, in England and Wales had important consequences, in Chile in particular, because there were many, many victims in Chile who suddenly were given voice by the decision of the House of Lords uh, in, uh, in London. But it had other effects. It stopped other former dictators from traveling. One read in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung not, not too many months later that the former dictator of Indonesia, President Sahota, had canceled uh, a, 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 an appointment in a, in a German clinic for him, where he was used to going uh, for treatment. How uh, Mariam, the, the, the former Salani, the former dictator of, of Ethiopia, uh, was given asylum in Zimbabwe and came to Johannesburg in my country for medical treatment. Human Rights Watch in New York got to hear about it, raised a hue and cry, and, and how Mariam meant just to. Visa hasty retreat back to Zimbabwe. 
It's remarkable that the dictators, that the oppressive leaders, who don't think twice about violating the rights of their, of their people, seek for themselves the best medical treatment that the world can offer. They also seek holidays at the most expensive pleasant holiday resorts. Well, universal jurisdiction has begun to bite, and it may be grand news for their travel agents, but it's good news for them. <laughs> The 14 international conventions dealing with terrorism, and they began in the 1970s, not, not after 9-11 of 2001. The international conventions dealing with aeroplane hijacking, with taking diplomats as hostage, with taking ships on the high seas, all of those anti-terrorism uh, conventions and important ones uh, in, the, in the aftermath of 9-11 all provide for universal jurisdiction. So that, that aspect of international criminal justice is there, and more and more courts around the world are being armed by their parliaments, by their governments, with the power to exercise universal jurisdiction over the most serious uh, crimes that the international community uh, suffers from. The Genocide Convention, interestingly, didn't recognize universal jurisdiction, didn't confer universal jurisdiction. That dated from 1948. Interestingly, in, in, again in hindsight, it provided that jurisdiction for the most horrible of all crimes, genocide, which requires the intent to kill off a people or a part of a people. The Genocide Convention said jurisdiction will lie in domestic courts or in an international court having jurisdiction. In 1948, the drafters of the Genocide Convention and the United Nations, where the Genocide Convention was passed unanimously, assumed that there would be an international criminal court having jurisdiction in respect of war crimes committed anywhere. What stopped that was the Cold War. Russia and China during the Cold War would have no trouble with an international criminal court. And it was put on the back burner. Draft rules and procedures for an international criminal court gathered a, a, a lot of dust uh, in, 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 in back rooms uh, in Geneva and at the United Nations headquarters uh, in, uh, in New York. It was only in 1993, again to the surprise of the, of, 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 of the most seasoned international lawyers, that the United Nations Security Council set up the first ever international criminal court for the former Yugoslavia, and that was followed in the following year by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. As a footnote, it's interesting that the United States is unique in, in allowing what is in effect universal jurisdiction for civil claims arising from serious violations of human rights uh, of, of, of foreign. The Alien Talks Act of 1789 <coughs> provides jurisdiction uh, in federal courts where foreigners can sue foreigners for serious human rights violations recognized by the United States. Very unusual provision and, and, and some people refer to it as an example of United States arrogance and allowing its, its federal courts uh, to have that sort of that sort of jurisdiction. It's not. It, 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 it was an unusual development in the 18th century to deal with ambassadors' uh, rights being, being, <coughs> being violated. It was intended to deal with piracy. It was intended to deal with piracy and so forth. In the last two or three decades, federal courts have exercised that jurisdiction in modern time. It was attacked uh, 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 last year in the United States Supreme Court. The Bush administration uh, argued that that, that that law, that the Alien Courts, that the Alien Tort Claims Act had been misinterpreted by the federal courts for uh, two or three uh, decades, and, and, and that it didn't confer this jurisdiction unless Congress acted. Happily, the United States Supreme Court, in the, in the, in the uh, six-three. Uh, decision uh, ruled against the, uh, the the approach of the Bush administration and, and, and in effect upheld uh, the approach of the federal courts in using the Alien Tort Claims Act 
uh, to, to, to allow foreign, foreign victims uh, to, in certain circumstances, to sue for civil, civil damages uh, for violation of their human rights. A few words about the United States approach to international law and to international courts, to international justice, not only in the criminal field, but also in the economic field. There's always been an ambivalence. The United States, and I'm oversimplifying and I hope I'm not being unfair, the, the attitude over more than a century has been international law is a good idea for the rest of the world, but not for us. <laughs> and we encourage the rest of the world to use it, to get on with it, but don't use it against our citizens. We want our citizens to be subject only to our courts and not to international. And that, that has been, that has been the, the contradictory attitude, supporting it with a but, uh, and, 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 and having, uh, having this, the, the, this fear of international courts, international organizations, uh, somehow having an anti-United States bias, which would make it unfair and, 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 and inappropriate uh, to make them, uh, to, to, to subject United States citizens to, to their jurisdiction. The United States was, above all countries, responsible for the establishment of the Yugoslavia Tribunal by the Security Council. It was the, it was, it was the Clinton administration, but in particular, the commitment of then Ambassador Madeleine Albright that got the United Nations Security Council moving to set up an international criminal tribunal. I had the difficult task of being the first chief prosecutor of that tribunal and having to set up an international prosecutor's office. And from my own personal experience, I can assure you that without the United States push, without the United States political and financial resources, that, that tribunal would never have got off its feet. It would never have got to work. And it was the United States that pushed for the Rwanda tribunal to be set up. And again, it was the United States that made it, made it a reality. The American Bar Association played a crucial role in ensuring fair trial in the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Uh, as I mentioned in, in, uh, in, uh, in my book, it was, it, it was the then director of the American Bar Association's Mark Ellis, the founding director, who came to the Hague soon after I arrived there. He said the American Bar would like to help you, the prosecutor of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. How can we help? And I said to him, the best way the American Bar can help is to ensure that defendants who come before this tribunal will have adequate defense counsel. And that appealed immediately to Mark Ellis and appealed to the American Bar Association. And in the first trial, in the Tudich trial, uh, the American Bar uh, provided uh, the, 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 the finance uh, to, to hire two British barristers, experienced criminal barristers, to join the Dutch leader of the Tadic team. And the reason was that the judges had decided that the tribunal should have more or less an adversarial system of trial. The trial you and I are used to, where counsel fight each other in front of a sort of neutral uh, a judge and a referee are not an active participant uh, as judges are in the civil system where they have an inquisitorial system. Tadic was offered a list of counsel who offered their services uh, to the registrar of the court. Not pro bono, they got paid by the United Nations, not too handsomely, but not too badly. And his eye fell on the name Vladimir. Tadic was a Serb and he knew that Russians liked Serbs and he knew Vladimirov was a Russian. And he said, I'll have him. Vladimirov didn't speak a word of Russian. His grandfather had emigrated to Holland as a youngster. And Vladimirov, fortunately, was a leading criminal lawyer in The Hague. But he never cross-examined. He never was to cross-examine But he would have to cross-examine the prosecution witnesses against Tadic. And he realized very quickly he didn't know how to do that. And the American bar employed these two barristers for two weeks to come and teach Vladimir off how to cross examine. It didn't take too many hours for, for the three of them to realize 
You can't learn to cross examine in two weeks. <laughs> the American bar then realized that, that they should go further and they employed the two balances to join Vladimirov's team. Because at that point the UN was prepared only have finance for one council, not three. Very soon after that, I'm happy to say that the registrar of the court in the Hague agreed that the United Nations would pay for all three of them. But that, that, that was crucial. If the Yugoslavia Tribunal had unfair trials, it would have been at the death knell of international tribunals, of international courts. And it was the Americans on our staff, and, and we had more Americans than any other nationality by far, and again, it was the generosity of the United States government. When the office was opened, 23 leading United States lawyers, prosecutors, investigators, computer technicians were sent from Washington at no cost to the United Nations, uh, but at the cost of the United States government. And, 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 and they, they played a very important role, a crucial role, in ensuring the fairness of the procedures uh, in, uh, in, in the Yugoslavia tribunal. It was the successes of the two tribunals of the United Nations, and they were, they were important successes. Firstly, the law advanced. The law of war had never been used. There was no court in the world that had applied them. So they were wonderful laws on paper, but laws that aren't implemented are not worth much more than the paper that they're written on. So the law was, was not only being used, but advanced. Just as one example, the, the, the recognition of systematic mass rape and other gender crimes as war crimes was something new and only happened because of the evidence that was accumulated and, and activist women judges on the two tribunals who encouraged the prosecutor uh, to, to, to charge rape uh, appropriately as war crimes. Huge advances in, in, in that area and other areas. The demonstration that fair trials could be held in an international tribunal, that wasn't a given, it wasn't accepted, it was doubtful. about it. But I haven't read or heard any serious criticism of the fairness of the trials uh, before the international tribunals sitting in the Hague or in Arusha, as in the case of Rwanda. Though, those successes led to the push for a permanent international criminal court. And again, it was Madeleine Albright who encouraged Kofi Annan, then newly uh, 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 elected, appointed Secretary General of the United Nations, to call the diplomatic conference in Rome in the middle of 1998. 184 nations turned up, and 120 voted in favour of the Rome Treaty to set up the International Criminal Court. Regrettably, at that point, the United States policy changed almost 180 degree turn, still during the Clinton administration. It was, the, it was the Pentagon, it was the military who feared American citizens appearing before any international criminal court. They said we'll get runaway prosecutors, dishonest judges, uh, bias against the United States, and that's not for us. And it's a matter for regret, I would suggest that, that, that President Clinton was not prepared to, to buck the Pentagon. Because that's where it came from, and I speak from some personal knowledge, meetings I had uh, at that time uh, with, with, with senior uh, members of the Clinton administration uh, and at the Pentagon uh, in, uh, in Washington. And the Clinton administration tried to curtail the power of this new International Criminal Court. They said only the Security Council should be able to trigger an investigation by the International Criminal Court. That, that, that way they could, by the use of their veto, stop any investigations that they didn't like, that could have been embarrassing uh, to, uh, to uh, either to Washington or to a friendly uh, capital. It was rejected, and, and rightly so. To have an International Criminal Court dependent on a political gatekeeper, which the Security Council is, Rather, in my, in, uh, certainly in my view, rather don't have a court, an international court at all. And the majority, the great majority of the nations in Rome said, no, we're not prepared to do that. The United States then said, well, 
As second prize, we want the system of what's called complementarity, that the International Criminal Court can only have jurisdiction if the court of the nationality of the alleged criminal is unable or unwilling itself to investigate the alleged crime. And, and under this system, the International Criminal Court would have no jurisdiction if an American was alleged to have committed a war crime, no jurisdiction if the United States itself wishes in good faith to investigate the, the alleged crime, no matter what the outcome. And the nation assembled in Rome said, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. And that's the system that was accepted. And the system, the, the position under the Rome Treaty is that the court has no jurisdiction where the, where the national courts or the national government can be a military tribunal itself decides to investigate. In order to attract jurisdiction, the prosecutor would have to prove to a three trial to, to a three-judge pre-trial chamber, go and appeal to a five-judge panel that the domestic investigation was in fact a charade, was a fraud designed to, to, to rob the International Court of Jurisdiction. Almost, I would suggest, almost an impossible burden to prove in the case certainly of any democracy. I can't, I can't believe that a prosecutor would be able to establish that a, 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 a serious investigation, whether in the United Kingdom or the United States or any other democracy, uh, was, was intended uh, to be a sham, a sham investigation. But that was accepted. It still didn't satisfy uh, the, 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 uh, the Pentagon <coughs> and the, the, the Clinton administration uh, joined only six other nations, including Yemen and Qatar and China, uh, in, in opposing the, the International Criminal Court uh, Treaty. President Clinton, of course, at the end, in the end, signed the treaty, not happily, he signed it, he refused to send it to the Senate, but the United States, by its signature, indicated that it would cooperate and, 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 and certainly would not do anything to undermine the International Criminal Court. The court required for its life to begin 60 countries to ratify. The fact that 120 countries signed wasn't sufficient. 60 parliaments had to ratify. And many people thought that would take a decade and more. It took less than four years. By April 2002, the 60th country has, uh, had ratified. When I checked yesterday on, on, on my computer, 94, uh, 97 countries have now ratified uh, the, the statute of the International Criminal Court. And I'm optimistic for it. I believe that there is a critical mass of nations around the world. Almost exactly half of the members of the United Nations have now ratified. And that includes every single member of the European Union. There's hardly a traditional ally of the United States that has not ratified the statute for the International Criminal Court. Unfortunately, President Bush has taken much more, a much more active role to undermine the court, threatening, ragooning governments to enter into uh, really ridiculous agreements in terms of which these governments undertake not to hand American citizens to the International Criminal Court. I mean, can you imagine the Moldavs uh, handing, handing Americans to the International Criminal Court? But, but the, these are the agreements which have been sought, and I think when, when I last saw some, some 54 uh, countries have entered into, into those agreements. Nonetheless, I, I remain, as I say, optimistic because of the critical mass of uh, nations that have joined the court. Let me give you just one example of how that court, I believe, should be used today. We've all read about the terrible crimes being committed in the Sudan, in Darfur. Crimes committed against non-Arab citizens of the Sudan. Uh, millions of people forced from their homes. Hundreds of thousands forced into situations of starvation and death. Secretary of State Colin Powell, appropriately in my view, has expressed the view of the United States that this is a genocide. Being a genocide, there's a duty, there's an obligation on countries recognizing that to do something about it, to stop genocide. 
There have been weak resolutions in the Security Council through no fault of the United States. China has, 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 has weakened those resolutions under threat of veto. It, it, it's a situation that I would have thought cried out for the Security Council to instruct the International Criminal Court, which it can do under the Rome Treaty, to immediately investigate war crimes in the Sudan. For the Security Council to, to put together sufficient military force, and it can get it from Africa if it wishes to, to authorize military force to go and arrest, to apprehend people who the International Criminal Court indicts. Really, is, it would, would be a wonderful use immediately of the powers of the International Criminal Court. And it would send a message. It would send a message that the international community, that the Security Council, is no longer prepared to sit by idly as it did uh, in the Rwanda genocide. Uh, never again, President Clinton apologized on behalf of the United States for not doing more to stop the Rwanda genocide. It could do it, it could do something right now at really very little cost. It wouldn't even be contrary to the approach of the United States that the Security Council should hold the, the key to trigger the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. I fear, unfortunately, that, 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 that the attitude and, and, and the almost pathological hatred of leaders of the Bush administration towards the International Criminal Court is going to, uh, is going to stop uh, any, any such action. The, the effect of 9-11. Terrorism, I would suggest, harms democracy by making its citizens believe that their liberties are a source of weakness. The opposite is the truth. Your liberties, I'm happy to say to South Africa, my liberties are a source of strength, not a source of weakness. It is disproportionate responses to terrorism that harm democracy and imperil liberty. And the challenge facing democracy is to find a proportionate response. The two leading democracies, the United States and the United Kingdom, I would suggest have overreacted. They've endangered civil liberties in very material respects. In the United Kingdom, detention without trial for non United Kingdom citizens, the legality of which is being tested this week in the House of Lords a decision expected in the next six weeks or the this morning to be declined. In the United States, unbelievable secret deportation hearings, detention of American citizens without crime, no access to lawyers or family members. <coughs> and one reads this week in a report from Human Rights Watch, and let me say as a board member of Human Rights Watch, their reports have been exhaustively investigated and, and, and caretaken before going public. But this report deals with people who have been disappeared by the United States government. People who have been detained and who have disappeared. This horrible concept of disappearances that the United States has roundly condemned for decades in Latin America in particular. And the, the, the report goes through the definitions of disappearances. And they accurately state that they involve four elements. Deprivation of liberty against the will of the detainee. Direct or indirect involvement of government officials. Refusal to acknowledge the detention or to disclose the fate or whereabouts of the person concerned. And fourthly, the removal of the detainee from the protection of the law. And they detail exhaustively 11 cases where the facts are known of people who have been disappeared by the United States government. The report of, of, uh, that was set up by Secretary of, by Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, the report of General uh, Tabuba, stated this. He said this, he, top part of these disappearances involves the military not making, keeping any record of the name of the person that the CIA wishes to disappear. And the military unfortunately go along with it. 
and, 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 and cases were found by General Tabuba of, 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 of people whose names have been left off lists in order in Zaire to avoid the International Committee of the Red Cross from visiting them. And General Tabuba, a military, military inquiry, said this maneuver was deceptive, contrary to army doctrine, and in violation of international law. I've had the privilege in the last few months of, of, of giving talks, of giving addresses at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., maybe the premier military college, and more recently at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. What's impressed me, and it's again it's a reason for optimism, was the openness with which these issues are discussed as to the International Criminal Court. I was impressed with the strong views openly expressed by, by students at those army colleges in favour of the International Criminal Court and the shame they feel as military people uh, at, at, this sort of, at this sort of thing happening. In the report, in, 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 the, in the opinion, in the majority opinion in the United States Supreme Court, and again a reason for optimism, the United States Supreme Court has said this is not constitutional, that the federal courts do have jurisdiction over people in Guantanamo Bay contrary to the, to, to, to the strong arguments of the Bush administration. The United States Supreme Court has said that United States citizens cannot be kept in detention without trial, without access to lawyers, without access to family. And Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, certainly we agree that indefinite detention for the purposes of interrogation is not authorized. The United States law considers both prolonged detention without charges and trial and causing the disappearance of persons by the abduction and clandestine detention of those persons to constitute gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. And the, the hope is that, that, that our judges in the democracies are going to continue to act as a check on this sort of unjustified overreaction. In India, their Prevention of Terrorism Act, draconian provisions, completely uh, 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 repealed by the Indian Parliament in the aftermath of a recent election which put the previous government out of power. In my own country, the South African Cabinet initially approved a new act allowing for detention without crime. Unbelievable! A government consisting of people who suffered from detention without crime, now in government, are prepared to use this sort of method. But the African National Congress controlled Parliamentary Committee on Justice through it up. They said we're not prepared again to allow in our country people to be people to be detained without trial because we know what happened. This is the strength of